Hey dancers, welcome to the show. I'm Julie and I'm your host today on this episode of Broche Banter. In this season, we're talking all about ballet training, specifically for grown-ups. I'll be sharing my philosophy on why ballet should be for everyone, how to train in order to reach a high level in ballet, how adults can actually learn classical ballet technique with fully formed bodies and busy lives, and how we can make amazing changes to the ballet world to open its doors to more adults like us. Together, we're on the path to making ballet mainstream, making it normal to learn ballet as an adult, making it a part of the fabric of our society like cycling, rock climbing, yoga, and martial arts. So come along this ride with me and let's dance. Today on the show, we're gonna do something different than I had initially planned. My plan was to dive right into the technical facets because I'm such a technique geek and I know you are too. But as I sat down to write the episode, I realized I needed to first speak about the mind. The mindset facet was slated for episode eight, but it really is more important than that. And I feel that the next episodes will be better served by talking about this right up front. As excited as I am to dive into the technique, the mind is really the first thing to prepare. Of course, Like all facets, the mindset facet is optional. You're welcome to take or leave anything I lay out in this season. But I truly believe this particular facet is the one that will be the most effective way to help all other facets that excite you come to fruition. I'm going to preface this episode by saying that if you're here with me on this journey so far, you probably care a lot about ballet. Maybe it feels like your home, your identity, the missing piece of you. Maybe you care about it more than you think you should, or that you think you deserve to. Maybe you feel a little silly for caring about something so quote-unquote frivolous or juvenile so much. Maybe you have big dreams, dreams even bigger than you think you could achieve. Your friends, family, local ballet studios, and ballet friends may have varying levels of support or lack thereof. You might even feel alone or isolated in your pursuit of something so niche yet so meaningful. But either way, I'm going to just go out on a limb here and guess that you really care about ballet. You're here with me listening to this incredibly detailed podcast about ballet. So I'm just going to guess that you care a lot about it, just like I do. So here's the thing. When we care a lot about something, that passion can sometimes fuel us, but it can also derail us. When we care about a lot about something, it becomes very high risk. The possibility of failure has our identity wrapped in it. The things that you don't care that much about aren't that stressful. The possibility of something not going well isn't that big of a deal. But for the things you love, the things you can't live without, the things that are part of you, the possibility of trying and failing is sometimes too much to bear. You might have had thoughts like, if I try and don't succeed, can I still love ballet? Can I still keep ballet as part of my identity if I'm not a good dancer? If I can't hold my turnout or land my pirouette, is it still worth it to pursue? If I have flat feet, can I still keep dancing or should I just stop? Will I ever get any better or should I just remain a part of the audience and love ballet from the sidelines? If any of these thoughts have ever crossed your mind, this episode is definitely for you. Even if you have yet to step foot in a ballet studio, but you know that ballet is your calling, maybe by the end of this episode, we'll plant a seed that can grow into the courage to get started. When we're training our bodies, we must also train our minds. In the journey to advancing ballet, our mind needs to adapt and grow as much as our bodies, if not more. Here's the thing, without a positive and powerful mindset, we honestly won't be able to stick around long enough in our ballet journey to see real progress. Without an open mind, we won't be able to experiment and try the new things that are needed to change our habits and learn new patterns. And without a healthy relationship to our inner critic, we'll just frustrate and torture ourselves until ballet isn't fun anymore. How do I know this? Well, I started ballet in a state of mind that made it difficult for me to hear feedback, apply corrections, and even believe that I could dance. As they say, it takes one to know one, and I get it on the deepest possible level. I'm right here with you, a perfectionist at heart. If you've ever thought or felt something negative or discouraging about your body, your potential, your worthiness, or your ballet technique, I've probably thought the same thing too. But I want you to be able to use ballet as a vehicle to find freedom and joy and not get crushed under the weight of finding the perfect fifth position. Don't get me wrong. I'm going to help you find the perfect fifth position too, but we need our minds to be ready for it. 
So let's dive into how to have fun working on the details of technique, how to enjoy ballet, and how to keep coming back for long enough to actually make meaningful progress in your dancing. Ballet is like a road trip. Pack some snacks, we're going to be here for a while. First of all, I just want to say it takes a long time to get good at ballet. There are no shortcuts and we're going to be here for a while. Just because it looks easy doesn't mean it is. Ballet is hard for everyone. To be clear, it's not impossible. In fact, quite to the contrary, it's very possible for any person to learn. Possible, but not easy. Hard, but not impossible. So if you hear the word hard and cringe, let's just start off with a quick confidence booster right off the bat. You already do a lot of things that are hard and you make them look easy. Here's a couple. It takes a long time to get good at your native language. How many years does it take before a child has a mastery of English? I mean, I couldn't say my R's for years. I broke my right arm when I was five and my dad still loves to tease me about how I used to say I broke my wide home. But now I can say those R's flawlessly without even a thought. It takes a long time to get good at walking. How many years before a child walks as confidently as an adult? And then they do it effort free. It takes a long time to get good at raising kids, your career, communicating with your spouse or your family, typing, texting, driving, tying your shoes, and doing your hair. All of these things started out really hard. So if you dream of a high level in ballet, whether that's with your artistry, your pirouettes, high legs, flexibility, point work, gracefulness, or coordination, we'll be here for a while. Mind you, I didn't say we won't get there. The great news is though, adult life is long and we're not really in a rush. I mean, we always wanna be better, faster, stronger and all that, I definitely do too, but there's no deadline by when we must be done with ballet in order to get a professional contract or something. There's no age limit. We have our whole life to allow our ballet journey to unfold. So if we're gonna be here for a while, we need some tools to stick around for that while. So let's approach the whole process with the same patience you would on a road trip. It's gonna take a long time to drive there, Even if you drive a little faster than everyone else and take all the toll roads, it's still a long time. You might get lost. You'll probably have to stop and rest. So bring snacks, something fun to listen to, and enjoy the scenery. Just because we'll be on the road for a while doesn't mean we won't get there. And besides, just being there isn't the point, or else you'd have just taken a plane. Let's talk about motivation, perfectionism, and your inner critic. So at first glance, it might seem like we need motivation to stay long enough to see progress. But motivation is funny. Some things we need it for and others we don't. But why? Sometimes I receive this question. I love ballet so much, but I can never seem to find the motivation to go to class. I'm so frustrated that I want to go to class, but can't seem to motivate myself to do it. But here are some questions. Do you need motivation to eat your favorite dessert? Pet your dogs? Go on a tropical vacation? Watch TV? Or whatever it is you love. So then why do we need motivation for ballet if we love it so much? Let's explore. Well, I think a lack of motivation in this case is more to do with your inner critic, that little voice. We all have it, you know the one. It takes a different shape for each of us, but it's there, nagging, complaining, moaning, and groaning. Mine, it likes to remind me that I'm incapable, inadequate, unable to achieve my goals, undeserving of success, not good enough, should just give up now, and there's no point in even trying. I know this voice really well. We've been together as long as I can remember. We live together in this body. Somehow I'm the one doing all the work and that little voice is just tagging along to bring me down. What the heck is that about? But I digress. (laughs) Is anything sounding familiar here? What does your voice say? Especially listen to your voice, what you say to yourself during and after class. How do you make yourself feel? Do you berate yourself for not being better at ballet? When you forget a combination or notice that your legs didn't stay out, do you beat yourself up and wonder why you're so stupid or incompetent? Do you dwell on the mistakes you make and the inadequacies in your technique or even see them as a sign you'll never improve? Do you feel like even though you just spent an hour in class, it should have been three hours and that you're never going to get anywhere at this rate? Do you wonder if your feet or your hips can ever improve enough to make a difference? Do you think that all the other dancers in class are so much better than you and so what's the point in even continuing? Or do you even belittle yourself for how you look in the mirror? 
What if you have a bad day in class? Have you ever wanted to quit ballet because you took a class where you weren't at your best? And you might even wonder, what's the point in continuing? It's going to take too long to get there anyways. If you've ever thought these things or felt these things, then yeah, it's no wonder you don't want to go to ballet class. I don't want to do the things that make me feel sad, worthless, or bored either. You don't need motivation. You need an invitation to change your relationship with that voice. While perfectionists are often attracted to ballet for its detailed nature and perfect idealized form, many times this same perfectionism that gives you so much of your drive can also hinder your enjoyment and therefore, dare I say, your ability to progress. That little voice, it knows how badly you want ballet and it thinks it knows how to get you to your goals. So it tries to motivate you how it knows how, through negativity. If you're anything like me, That negativity has been powerful in my life and has been a big driver to get me to where I've been. Maybe yours has gotten you where you are today. Maybe it's your primary motivator. But you know what I've found? It's really only helpful for deadlines, to pleasing other people or to other external motivators. For the things you love and do just for you, that voice only serves to drive you away. When it's something just for you, that mean voice just makes you sad, not productive. Remember, when we care so much about something, we care. It's our identity. It's what we dream of. It's what we think about. We obsess over. In those cases, we care so much. Making mistakes, not being perfect, and not seeing a clear path to the finish line is really scary. And it flares up that inner critic. Even though it might seem like it's just a pirouette, seriously, that part of the journey, the part where we feel like we're mucking through it all, looking like a hot mess, not doing anything right, that part can really threaten something deep inside of us. Our identity, our inner critic, all of our anxieties, our fears, our tendencies, and our coping mechanisms all come right to the surface, often in the form of that little voice. But learning requires mistakes because mistakes are information. There's no person who ever learned to walk without a few or a bunch of tumbles or learned to talk without messing up some words or learned ballet without falling out of a bunch of pirouettes and forgetting many of the combinations. So next time you're feeling demotivated and not feeling like you want to go to class, take a big breath and listen. What is that voice saying? Is it helping you achieve your dreams or standing in the way? What if you could guide that voice on how to be more helpful? What if you could try thanking this voice for its efforts and ask it to take a back seat so that you can keep doing the work? Say, I know you're trying to protect me from the pain of failure because I love ballet so much, but what if the failure was the way? Thanks for the concern, but I'm getting my ballet slippers on and going to class because I am a dancer. The crux of it is when we can figure out how to feel good in class, We take away a little bit of that need for motivation so you can simply look forward to going to class and enjoying the hard work. You don't have to fight with that inner voice to to overcome it to come to class. You simply look forward to it. Let's get a little bit into perfectionism. Are you a perfectionist? I definitely am. You know, I think all of the issues I've outlined thus far are perpetuated because the whole ballet environment is run, led, taught, and perpetuated by perfectionists who have all gone through this cycle. Think about it. Ballet generally attracts and rewards people who like the idea of perfection, progress, details, minutia, focus, and hard work. It scratches all those little perfectionist itches of controlling every part of our body, reach an ideal of perfection, checking boxes. It's great. So then, think about the people who got to the top of the ballet world. How did they get there in a system that rewards perfectionists? Perhaps they got there by being the most intense. And then perhaps they're teaching those who came after them with that same intensity. Perhaps they have one of those super negative inner critics and they let, they let their critic run the show. Maybe they don't know of another way to be and they force their inner critic on everyone who comes after them. We see this. When some teachers even say that kids shouldn't be able to use toe pads in their point shoes because real dancers don't need them or back in the day they didn't use them or that rest days are bad and you'll lose all of your turnout if you take a break or that you should be cross training for two hours every day or else you'll amount to nothing or that dancers are born, not made. If a teacher is instilling fear in you or making you feel bad, 
I'd argue it's more about their perfectionism than about you. It's about their fear that they won't be able to teach you, that they're not doing enough, that they're inadequate and trying to prove their own worth somehow, or that your success might negate theirs. If you're successful and you didn't have to quote unquote earn your stripes, do you deserve it? If they feel like they didn't deserve it, then they may feel like you don't deserve it either. All the fear you have about your own technique, they might have about their teaching or about their studio or whatever it is. They might also be afraid if they're not enough or if they can really help you or what's the point in working with this person if they're not already great. The ballet world will continue to change, especially as it continues to be opened up to more people and has less and less of a scarcity mindset. We, you, are changing it right now. It's happening before our eyes. But change is as slow as ballet progress is, so for now, as you work on your mindset, you will no doubt encounter situations that will test your strength and fortitude. Teachers might make fun of you, critique you with negativity or condescension. They might yell at you or get frustrated with you. They might not help you with something that you're really struggling with. Studio owners may treat you poorly or tell you that you're not worth teaching. Yes, I have heard all of these things happen, whether to me or to my students. To be clear, I am not defending this kind of behavior. In my opinion, this kind of behavior is not an acceptable way to treat someone who is spending their free time trying to better themselves. I offer this as an explanation or a shift in perspective to help you Take the negativity you might encounter with a grain of salt. Don't let it flare up your own inner critic. Don't let it echo that voice. Be brave enough to know that it's the teacher, not you, or a reflection on your potential as a dancer. Either keep that forefront of your mind or find a different environment, plain and simple. Stop supporting that environment with your time, your energy, and your money. But remember, it's not about you. You can be a dancer. You can change your inner voice. You can keep going in spite of what these other environments or these people might say to you. To be honest, I have my own moral dilemma with teaching ballet to perfectionists. I love ballet, as you know. (laughs) There are a few things I love more, except maybe my family, my fiance, and my greyhounds. But ballet has this dark side. It can be beautiful and enjoyable, but it can also really bring out that negativity if you let it. It's tough to teach ballet to people who I know might also be perfectionists, especially because for a while when I was younger, I allowed ballet to feed into the destructive part of my perfectionist tendencies, and I know how easily it can slip back in there, even for adults. I worry that I'm a part of perpetuating the cycle for my fellow perfectionists. I teach lots of technique and minutia in class, And although I try to make it as fun and welcoming as possible, we work on it all. Posture, pour de bras, turns, turnout, feet, point work, and I ask for a lot in class. We work on that perfect fifth. We really do. That's because I believe in the dancers and because I have no doubt that they can learn what I'm teaching. But I also know that that dark inner voice can be so easily sparked and fired up. Some days I wonder if I should stop teaching ballet and encourage all the perfectionists to take hip hop or tap or something else so they don't get caught up in this perfectionist cycle. And I wonder if teaching technique is part of the cycle and if I should let the details slide instead of teaching all the nitty gritty stuff. Day after day though, I choose to keep coming back because I honestly believe that in the right environment, ballet in all of its perfectionist glory, (laughs) can give perfectionists a chance to use their ballet training as a tool to overcome and understand their perfectionism and not to fuel it within them. To see it for what it is, to develop the tools to work with it, and to take those tools to the rest of their life. How to keep your mind calm. How to push for more because you're curious if there's more, not as punishment. How to use your breath to be okay with the messy parts of the learning process. And honestly, manage the anxiety that comes with any quest for greatness so that you can stay on the path long enough to get there. I try my best to help dancers on their journey and infuse my tips, teaching, and classes with the positive mind that I believe it takes to make it to the other side in one piece. As I've said, I didn't start out with this kind of optimism. I used to think that when my teachers asked me for more, more turnout, more lift in the core, faster movements, that it meant I was inadequate. I would think, but I've already turned out my legs. What more can I do? Or I've already pulled up. Isn't that enough? It used to discourage me to no end and make me feel like I'd never be good enough. I would get so sad and frustrated and I even quit ballet a few times. 
I struggled to go to class on a regular basis and had sporadic attendance despite the love and passion. But now I see from a different perspective, from working with so many people like me. I see it has no bearing on my self-worth. Looking for more doesn't mean you're not already trying. It's simple. Our body is designed to save energy. It doesn't want to use so much energy and it hides our superpowers from us. It keeps the 100% strength in its back pocket for a rainy day. So our body is just doing its job trying to protect us. Asking for more is not a comment on worthiness or adequacy as a human, but it's a reminder to continue to negotiate with my body, to allow my body to trust me enough to give me more energy and to work together to toe the line between what I can already do and what I'll be able to do next. This is an exploration because we can, not because we need to, not because we're inadequate, but because it's fun to discover new superpowers that you never knew you had. Ballet doesn't have to be stressful in order to get results. You can take something seriously and still enjoy it. Ballet is what we love. You love it. I love it. We all love it. So I strive to use ballet as a way to teach those principles and help people find peace and joy in their dancing while they work on that perfect tendu. Then maybe, just maybe, we'll be able to apply that peace and joy to the other areas of our lives where that inner critic comes out swinging. Let's change gears a little bit and talk about commitment and fear. Are you committed to ballet? Actually committed to putting in the work? Or is there anything holding you back from being ready to put in said work? For example, I used to be afraid and wonder, how good can I really get at ballet? Some dancers reach out with fear of turnout, saying, I've always had bad turnout and grew up pigeon-toed and I don't think I can dance. Or, I have really flat feet and I'm sure I'll never be able to get on point. These fears, these doubts, will stop us from believing that it's worth it to put in the work to get there. It's hard to imagine sometimes, but if you don't believe in the possibilities, then you won't get there. I always remember hearing that trite saying, whether you believe you can or you believe you can't, you're right. I mean, I always thought it was a little, a little out there. How could just believing ensure that you'd get where you want to go, right? As someone who likes an A to Z plan, boxes to check, how can belief be one of those boxes? Give me step by step. Well, if you're skeptical, just like I was, <laughs> perhaps coming at it from the opposite side is easier to see. Believing you can't definitely will stop you from getting there. We don't bother to work on the things that we don't think are worth it. Take as an example, waiting in a long line at the grocery store. That line is really long. You're waiting for a while. You look at the items in your cart and you think, hmm, is it really worth it to keep waiting in this line? And you go through the trade-offs. How badly do I need these items? Can I come back later? Is it worth it? Maybe you decide to stay in the line and then a little later, when the line really doesn't seem to be moving, you assess again. How badly do I really need these items? I can probably just go to the store on my lunch break. And then maybe at that point, the line wasn't worth it and you abandoned it. Now, you'll never make it to the front of the line because you decided it wasn't worth it to keep putting in the work. Of course, to be clear, that's always your decision to make. As I say with all of this, all of this is your decision to make. But I want you to see the decisions you're making and make them on purpose, not because you feel like you have no choice. That was a decision. So when it comes to your own dreams of better turns, improved turnout, graceful footwork in the center, as you wade through the mucky learning process, it's no different. You're always assessing, is it worth it? Should I keep going or should I give up? Let me tell you a story. I wondered how could I could get at ballet for the longest time. Every class was a time I would wonder if I could improve. Every mistake or moment of forgotten turnout was a time to wonder if I'd ever figure it out. Could I be as good as that dancer over there? Could I ever get my legs up higher? <laughs> could I ever land a double pirouette, much less a single? I wasn't sure if I could ever get on point or if I could ever perform. Would I ever get to be the ballerina of my dreams? I had so many questions that no one could answer. I would obsess over them. Unfortunately for eager and anxious past Julie, the answer was that I had to first stop wondering and spend that energy on committing to doing the work instead. I had to keep showing up, trust the process, find good teachers, and then let the chips fall where they would. Because I spent so much time stressing about not getting there, believing I couldn't, I would get so easily discouraged, lose motivation, and quit. 
even though I had so many exercises that I could do to get better turnout or things to practice and work on, because I wasn't sure if I could ever get there, I would give up or not feel like working on it. What's the point of putting in the work if I don't believe I will get there? There is no point if you don't believe, and so therefore we don't do the work. But the truth is, this requires belief because no one knows how good any of us will really get. It really depends on how long we keep at it, how willing we are to take a step back on our path forward, how open are we to letting the training take its course. Will we trust a teacher when we need to lower our legs to get better technique or revisit the basics? Or when we need to fall out of a thousand pirouettes to our first one, will we keep trying? We can't know the answer ahead of time as to how good we'll get. So we have to believe, we have to trust the process, and we have to believe in our prospects for long enough to keep putting in the work and actually see results. It's kind of like sleep, where the more you stress about getting sleep quickly, the less likely you are to sleep. But if you can allow the process of sleeping to take place, you're more likely to get to sleep. For an eager person like me, this is always a tough pill to swallow. So to wrap it up, let's take the conversation back down to earth with some practical solutions for those days when you're in the trenches with your body on one side and your inner critic on the other and just feeling all the feels. The second arrow is a concept in meditation where the thoughts accompanying an event are often more damaging than the event itself. So the idea of the second arrow is that if someone gets hit by an arrow, that's the first arrow, and lives to tell the tale, the wound from that arrow will heal. But the second arrow, the fear that comes, the uncertainty, the change in the worldview that came from having been shot by an arrow, the skepticism about the human race, all of these things the second arrow, have a longer lasting impact on the person's life and livelihood on the long run than the first arrow ever did. So if you've lost your turnout, forgotten the steps, or fallen out of a pirouette, the first arrow, and then panicked or beat yourself up right afterward, the mental anguish or the second arrow is more devastating than the small brief loss of technique or the small mistake or the small pirouette you fell out of ever would be. Try to be mindful of the words that you use to speak to yourself about ballet. Don't even get me started on the word corrections and doing it right versus wrong. As if you're bad and need to be fixed. Or as if there's only one right, when in reality there are many rights along the journey. Perfection is a direction, but the word right or correct implies that there's a destination. We are currently and always will be on the journey one step at a time. Try to reframe the information from your teachers as tips, pointers, feedback, or observations. Instead of coming out of class saying to yourself, I'm so bad at everything and I got so many corrections in class, try saying, I'm learning something new in ballet and I got so many tips in class. If you learn a new piece of information, instead of saying, oh my gosh, I've been doing tondus wrong this whole time, how embarrassing, try instead saying, I just learned something that will really take my tondus to the next level. How exciting. Each new layer does not negate the previous layer. Learning a new concept doesn't necessarily mean we were previously wrong. It means we took another step on our personal journey. We've outgrown where we once were and we're leveling up. Right is relative and you can be right at the beginner level, which is different than right as an intermediate, which is different than right as a perfectionist ideal that no one will ever be. So buckle up and enjoy the ride because we'll be here for a while and that's the point. Once you reach your current goals, you'll set new goals and more new goals and more new goals. And if you put your self-worth on these new goals or you wait until the end to allow yourself to be happy, the thing is you're just never gonna reach that end. Success feels like nothing. It's just another day and you're still you. Happiness has to come from within. It comes from enjoying every day, from looking at hard things and knowing you can overcome them or at least believing. Then eventually you'll start relishing the challenge and the challenge will make you happy you'll feel a sense of agency that you have choice in your life. The individual days is what matters. Not that each day is fun or 100% pleasant. Some days downright suck. But what if it was about learning to enjoy the mundane, learning to enjoy the small steps, the challenges, the backward progress, all of it. All of it is your life. Your life is just made up of a bunch of days, including the bad ones. Wherever you go, there you are. When you make it to the top, your inner critic comes with. When you achieve your goals, your self-doubt is right there with you. Your greatest fears, your biggest regrets, the parts of you that you don't like, they all come with you. They don't magically disappear with some mythical goal or finish line that you cross. You have to work now to send those demons away. So the next time you're feeling discouraged, demotivated, or not good enough, 
try asking yourself the following questions and just listen for what comes back. What if I'm already good enough, even while I strive to be better? What if I could be a masterpiece and a work in progress at the same time? What if today could be a great day, even if I want tomorrow to be better? What if even though I am a work in progress, I am worth working on? So dancers, remember you're not alone in your journey. It's a long road. We're all here in this together. And day by day, we learn to have a little bit of fun, get a little better each day. And even on the days where we get a little worse, trust that in the long run, we are on a beautiful and wonderful journey towards becoming the ballet dancers of our dreams. So until next time, happy dancing. Thanks for listening today, dancers. Before we head out, please make sure you leave us a review or just a five-star rating on the podcast app where you have accessed this podcast. It really does help us out and help us reach more ballet dancers like you. For more adult ballet, you can follow our studio on Instagram and Facebook at Broche Ballet. You can follow me on Instagram at Julie the Ballerina or check out our blog and YouTube channels for more content. You can even dance with us in our online studio with daily live Zoom classes and our on-demand library. I'm Julie Gill, and this was Broach Banter.